Welcome to another Audio Cultures lecture entitled Ways of Listening. In this lecture, we'll continue our investigation of listening by considering the differences between hearing, listening, perceiving, and comprehending. We will reflect on what constitutes audio culture and think through the objective and subjective poles and intersubjectivity or virtuality of sonic experience. Student surveys are now available, and I would really appreciate your feedback on your experience in the subject this semester. We've had some uh, rather interesting challenges with the way that we've delivered the subject this semester, and I'd really like to hear from you on what worked and what didn't. We're going to think through the definition of sound, and we're going to look at some of the perspectives from some key thinkers, both from a musical perspective, from an anthropological perspective, and from a philosophical perspective. We'll consider the views of the French theorist and composer Pierre Schaeffer, and look at his modes of listening. We'll listen to some music by the UK-based New Zealand composer Dennis Smalley and his concept of listening intentions. And we'll look at the work of Eric Clark and his concepts around ecological listening. And then finally, we'll consider this week's reading by Stokita and Brebeck de Mori and their concept of postures of listening. I want to start with a provocation. Uh, This is a famous uh, koan. A koan is a a kind of uh, challenge to thinking that uh, is used in Zen Buddhism uh, from Japan. And the koan goes something like this. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make any sound? So this is a question I want you to consider. How can we respond to uh, to this challenge? for a definition of sound. I want you to spend a bit of time thinking about this. What is sound? Can we define it? Perhaps you might want to look it up in the dictionary or make a note of your understanding and we'll bring these ideas back into the tutorial and share them. I'd like to start by introducing you to some philosophical perspectives about sound. In this week's reading, Stoikita and Brebeck de Mori critique the scientific understanding of sound as variations in air pressure. They suggest that uh, what we need is a more specific description of the kinds of things that people sense with their ears. What are the kinds of things that people hear? And they argue that it doesn't really make much sense to say that they hear vibrations or changes in air pressure. The musicologist and sound theorist Mark Grimshaw wants to suggest that there are two different conceptions of sound, a virtual conception of sound and a physical conception of sound. So the physical conception is the scientific understanding of variations in air pressure that cause sensation for a listener. Mark Grimshaw suggests that sound is an emergent perceptual phenomenon his answer to the question about whether when a tree falls in the forest does it make a sound is no essentially because sound is a perceptual phenomenon but it's not just about our subjective perceptions he says that it's an emergent phenomenon now the concept of emergence suggests that these kinds of phenomena are complex that is it depends very much on the context in which we hear It depends on us as a listener, what our skills, training and background is, what sort of attention we're applying and what sort of activities we're engaged in. But these questions go right back to Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. And he had a concept similar to the virtual and the physical, which he called the potential and the actual. He said that actual sound is always something in relation to something and in something. So this is similar to the idea of emergence. 
a sound is actualized uh, when it is a sound of some source, and it's always in relation to a listener, and sound is always transmitted in some kind of medium. So these three things, a source, a listener, and a medium of transmission need to come together, and this is further complicated by the relationship, the actions, the behaviours of both the listener and the sound source. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to uh, some concepts from a field of, of philosophy called phenomenology. This was developed at the beginning of the 20th century by a German philosopher called Edmund Husserl, and uh, it was taken up by uh, various others in the history of the 20th century, uh, in particular, a French philosopher called Merleau-Ponty, who was particularly interested in the phenomenology of perception, including the perception of sound. Part of the philosophical apparatus of phenomenology is something called intentionality, and this diagram is meant to describe uh, what Husserl called intentionality. So, phenomenology is interested in phenomena, that is, things that appear to us through perception, at the beginning of this slide, I played a sound. Now, if I was to take a phenomenological approach to this sound, I would start by perhaps trying to think about how my consciousness is directed towards that sound. I could say straight off that what I heard was a dog bark. If I listen to it again, then I'm paying a different kind of attention to it, but perhaps underlying the initial perception of a dog bark um, was some basic process which we might call perceiving. I need to have the capacity to hear, to perceive. And then uh, I might add another layer to that. Well, actually, you know, how do I understand this sound? Well, really, it must be a recording because there's no dogs around me. Um, it's a recording of a dog. So you can see the kind of attitude that I take to the sound, my, the way I focus my attention and the kind of cognitive processes around perceiving that sound determine to some extent what I hear. The way I describe it describes different kinds of things that I hear. So let's uh, have a quick look at this diagram. So we've got a listener at the left-hand end of the diagram and this listener has a, has a certain um, identity. We might call this a, a listening subject. Without a listening subject, there's no phenomenon, there's no appearance, there's no perception or comprehension. Then we have a kind of directedness. The listener is directing their consciousness towards something. And uh, Husserl called this noesis, using a, an old-fashioned Greek term that comes from Aristotle. This is a, the mode of experience, or the mode of attention. At the other end of this blue cone, we see uh, an image of the sound source, and Husserl called this the noema, the focus of attention, the objective terminus of the phenomenon. Actually, the focus of attention might be on the dog, or it might actually be on something in between the listener and the dog, which is the phenomenon, the sound itself. So looking further to the right, we see a, a range of cases of kinds of sound sources that this sound could be associated with. Now, that range of possible sources is determined by our cultural background, by the sorts of sound sources that we've been exposed to in our environment. Now, in this case, I've identified that sound as a border collie. Now, that assumes some kind of expertise, that assumes some kind of cultural background that's back there at the subjective terminus of this sound. So the sound changes depending on what my capacities as a listener are. Uh, it's not a brown bear, it's not a goat, it's an animal vocalisation, so we've got all of these animals here. It's not a Labrador, it's not a Dalmatian, or any of the other kinds of animal vocalisations that we might uh, see in that list of possible uh, sound sources on the horizon of our perception. So we might call this a sound event, 
an event is when something new, a uh, new state of affairs comes into play. An event marks the difference between the time before the sound and the time after the sound has occurred. So this event, this sound event, produces something positive, positive recognition. First, perhaps I thought I heard a dog or a dog bark. So perhaps in that moment, I recognized the sound of a dog and I also recognized a particular class of sounds, a bark. I perhaps also became aware of myself in terms of directing my attention to that sound. Maybe I was a little bit concerned that there was a dog in the room, you know. Um, all of a sudden it becomes uh, perhaps a danger to me as a listener. Now, I all the listening also produced for me the image of a collie dog, a border collie, a black and white dog. That was the image that appeared in my imagination, in my consciousness. So the event produced these things. The event also produced a kind of negative. The flip side of that is that the sound was uh, not a scrape or a bang or um, some other kind of sound from an inanimate object. It was a sound from uh, from something alive. So that rules out those inanimate sound sources. But to me, it didn't sound like the bark of a Labrador. It certainly didn't sound like a bear growling. Uh, and it certainly didn't sound like the class of sounds we might call a, a growl. So there's something happening here. Do we, did we hear a dog or did we hear a bark? Did we hear an external source, a physical cause, or did we hear a sound? Perhaps those two things happened simultaneously. So that's the first question we might ask ourselves when we come into this phenomenological uh, kind of analysis of sound. So by applying a phenomenological approach, I want to think about that mode of experience or attention did I locate the sound source? Where is that sound? So if it was a dog that I was listening to, perhaps it was over my shoulder. In this case, I'm wearing headphones, so it was in some sort of indeterminate space inside my head, which is kind of weird. But if my attention was directed towards a sound, a recording of a dog, a bark, then where is that sound located? Now this is complicated by the headphones. Normally I would hear the dog, you know, across the other side of the road or wherever the dog might be located. When I focus my attention on the bark, the sound itself, then this distinction starts to um, lose its specificity. Although I could still point towards where the sound came from if I wasn't wearing headphones. So then the, the third kind of questioning that I might engage in is, you know, to kind of really uh, listen carefully to that sound. What kind of dog is it? Um, or is it some other kind of creature and I just made a mistake? And finally, my, my intentionality might come back to myself. What is it about my understanding of dogs that enables me to identify it as a border collie when I start to think whether I am mistaken, was it a dog or a bear, now I'm really focusing my attention back on myself as a listener. So uh, in the bottom part of the diagram, we can see this kind of flow that happens when a phenomena occurs and when we start to take a phenomenological um, attitude towards understanding that experience. We start at uh, what Husserl calls the nomadic correlate, the first point of analysis in this case, a dog. Secondly, we think about how we're listening to it, how is it that we're discriminating it from a dog from a, from a bear, and we move closer into examining the sound itself, and then finally we come to consider ourselves as a listener. So, when you, you, you may hear the term phenomenology, and this is really a, an application of phenomenology towards understanding the experience of sound. Okay, so I mentioned the noesis or the subjective terminus. What sort of a listener am I? What are my capacities as a listener? And how does that influence the things that I hear? 
And one way of thinking about this is by thinking through uh, audio culture more broadly and also to think about specific listening disciplines that might enable me to apply certain listening skills that others might not be able to apply. So from a scientific perspective, scientific understanding of sound wants to imagine a kind of universal capacity of listening. And it does this by quantifying the types of responses that we as human beings have to sound stimulus. And this is called psychophysics. And from psychophysics, we understand things like the range of frequencies that we are sensitive to, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and the range of sound intensities, what's the quietest sound, what's the loudest sound that we and other listeners can hear. And these produce a set of normative measures of the capacities of all listeners, universal listeners. So here's the question, is hearing listening just a universal capacity uh, that we all share, or is it perhaps something more complicated? So the second uh, scientific or psychological perspective is a field of study called psychoacoustics, and this tries to understand the principles of sound perception, so not just of sound sensation. Psychophysics is interested in sensation, psychoacoustics is interested in perception. So from psychoacoustics we begin to understand how we are able to locate the position of a sound source by understanding what the differences between the signal that arrives at the two ears must be in order to locate the uh, position. Psychoacoustics is also interested in how we segregate, how we break up all the different sounds in our environment which arrive at our ears just as variations in air pressure. How do we break down those simple variations in air pressure into our capacity to separate the sound of the dog from the uh, sound of the wind outside? The window. So when we go to apply uh, these scientific principles from psychoacoustics and uh, psychophysics, we can apply those in the fields of human communication and telecommunications, in the design of PA systems, uh, microphones for recording, uh, telephone systems and audio systems on the internet, particularly things like lossy compression. These techniques, these techniques, Techniques apply knowledge from uh, the scientific disciplines. But there are other more specific forms of human communication. For example, uh, therapeutic communication in counselling and psychology. And here a listener must be trained in a, in a different kind of listening. A kind of empathic listening, a listening that understands uh, human expression in, uh, in, a, in a way that's really applied to helping people to overcome uh, problems that they may be having. Similar sorts of uh, listening techniques might be applied in business management. Here, rather than helping people, we might be trying to work out how to uh, help them to work more efficiently uh, for the gain of the organisation. Music composition requires a whole range of different kinds of listening skills. Those of you who have done some listening training will know that music uh, composition is enhanced if we're able to identify, recognize, sing uh, intervals and chords and chord shapes and to be able to identify and notate rhythms. Music performance requires a different set of listening skills. Here we need to be able to play in balance with the other performers in an ensemble and also to listen to the specific sound production of our instrument. There are a range of technical listening skills in, for example, mechanical engineering and medicine, the ability to diagnose faults in machinery by listening and also to diagnose medical issues uh, by the method of um, auscultation that's using the stethoscope or by uh, or other kinds of medical technologies. And of course in audio engineering we have another specific set of listening skills, the ability to identify characteristics of particular uh, recorded or reproduced sound and uh, apply that ability to recognize to changes that we make using the tools of audio engineering, the equalizer, the compressor, the mixing console and so forth. 
So you can see that there are more than one ways uh, to listen. And this was recognized by the French uh, theorist and composer Pierre Schaeffer, who, working in the 1940s and 50s, developed a set of theories around uh, radio broadcasting and the use of recorded sound. Now, Schaefer was aware of the work of uh, Edmund Husserl and uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and uh, he discovered something really interesting in the recording studio. So they were using uh, lacquer discs in those days to record to, um, and he discovered that if you put a scratch in the disc so that one groove joins up with another, you get a kind of repeated pattern of sound. And when you listen to that, it uh, can sort of lose its identity, uh, its link to the sound source, and take on a new kind of uh, perceptual property of being a sound in itself. And uh, the term reduced listening uh, was coined by Schaefer uh, based on Edmund Husserl's concept of the phenomenological reduction. This is where we forget about what we know about the about a perception and just look at the mode of experiencing the perception. So this piece of sound that you're going to hear is a, a loop. Uh, interestingly, it comes off the Voyager Golden Record, which was a record that was supposed to represent all of human society and culture sent off uh, in the Voyager spacecraft. able to find some other interesting examples uh, of reduced listening loops. Uh, there's a few nice ones on YouTube. Well, this sound started off being a kind of collection of sounds of some mechanical device. That's what it was intended to be. And then after some time of listening to it, it uh, breaks down into component parts uh, in our perception. And then perhaps we start to hear it as a rhythm or a pattern, or perhaps we start to hear other sounds emerging in it. So no longer is it the sound of a mechanical object, it becomes a sound in itself. Schaefer called this way of listening reduced listening in that it reduced the sound into a unitary phenomenon instead of sound referring back to its source or its cause. This led to the idea of creating a new kind of music, not based on notes and melodies, but based on sounds. He called this music concrete. This was music based on concrete sounds recorded and produced in the studio, rather than music that starts as abstract notation, which is realized by a musician performer. This in turn led to a whole new theory of music that he wrote about in his treatise on musical objects. 
Okay, I'm going to leave that little uh, excerpt of the piece Bass Metals by Dennis Smalley there. So the tradition of, uh, of music concrete uh, continued uh, through the 20th century into uh, the present century. And this example of the work by Dennis Smalley um, shows what happens when the initial interest in uh, you know, music of sounds uh, meets digital technology. Uh, this track's called Bass Metals, the idea uh, from alchemy of transforming ordinary uh, metals into gold through some kind of magical process. Um, this is a kind of music that's uh, not based on melody, harmony, definitely based on rhythm, but for her smallly, his interest was much more to do with the kind of gestural shapes that sound makes and uh, the kind of textures that we can produce with sound. So rather than melody, rhythm and harmony, Smalley is much more interested in gesture and texture. In Schaefer's uh, treatise on musical objects, he divided listening up into two kinds. Uh, he talked about specialist listening that is the kinds of listening that we uh, listed before that a car mechanic might apply or a composer or a therapist. Uh, so that's specialist listening on the one side and on the other uh, is everyday listening. He wanted to characterize how people listen in their normal uh, everyday activities. And he decided that uh, there's not just one way of listening and he tried to uh, divide up the different kinds of characteristic modes of listening in this uh, circuit of everyday listening. So the first mode is uh, what he called uh, listening, which is really listening out to the uh, source or cause of a sound, uh, a door slamming, a dog barking. And this is uh, thoroughly objective. It's uh, out there Sound, we're listening to something that's out there in the world for everybody else to hear, and it's uh, it's very concrete. Uh, it's linked to a material object outside in the world. The second mode that we might engage in is what Schaefer called perceiving, and this is really the kind of fundamental uh, capacity of a human organism to uh, be sensitive to sound. We perceive passively. Um, we perceive things that we don't necessarily uh, listen out for or try to understand things that are happening in the background. And this is a kind of subjective thing. Uh, it's part of what it is to be a human subject. And it's concrete in that it's what the basic uh, human physiological capacity for listening, for the basic sort of psychophysical principles of listening provide us with. The uh, third level of, his, of listening that Schaefer was interested in, he called hearing. And this is where we choose what uh, to hear. We're selective and uh, we apply a different kind of listening intention. We listen, so this might be the transformation from my listening to the dog to listening to the bark, the characteristic of that uh, sound, uh, that type 
that sound type. And this becomes more abstract. I identify it as a border collie. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a naming the sound. And once again, it's subjective. It's dependent on my capacity to hear, to differentiate different kinds of sounds. I might hear a sound and, you know, think it's a, it's a middle C on a piano, for example. I'm able to identify that because I'm able to identify the pitch and the kind of instrument that it is. And the final step in this uh, listening circuit is what Schaefer called comprehending. This is the kind of listening we apply when we uh, listen to human speech, for example. We're comprehending the meanings that are encoded in a human uh, language. But we might comprehend a sound as having meaning in some other kind of way. For example, we might uh, hear a particular chord shape in an arrangement on a guitar, or if we're undertaking some studio engineering, we comprehend a particular characteristic sound as being, you know, too much energy at three kilohertz that I can fix with an equalizer. So this is just one uh, approach to trying to break down the more complex phenomenon of uh, listening and try and understand it in more detail. And Schaefer says that we don't undertake one of these modes by itself. We're continually jumping between the three. So yes, I hear a dog and a bark and uh, I'm afraid it's going to bite me. And all of these things happen uh, simultaneously. So this, uh, these concepts of listening modes uh, inspired by Schaefer um, were taken up. Uh, that book was written in, uh, 19, in the 1960s and uh, others took up those basic principles. First was uh, a, another filmmaker and acousmatic uh, composer, Michel Chion. He's also an interesting film theorist. Um, he wrote a very interesting book on film sound called Audio Vision. He felt that uh, Schaefer's system was just a little bit too uh, complicated and he really felt that there were only three basic modes of listening. One is under understanding meaning in the sound, which he called semantic listening, uh, causal listening, where we're listening to the sound source, a door slamming, and a kind of listening where we apply uh, our attention to the properties of the sound itself, which he called, after Schaefer, reduced listening. The ecological psychologist William Gaver, who was interested in uh, thinking about sound for user interfaces in computers, uh, used uh, what he called ecological principles. They, they are principles that highlight how we interact or interrelate with things in our environment, in particular sounds in our environment. He broke down our ways of listening into two everyday listening, after Schaefer, and sort of normal everyday interactions, and a kind of focused listening that he called musical listening, where we're listening to the properties of the sound itself and evaluating it in aesthetic terms. Good sound, bad sound, interesting, pleasant, unpleasant. Uh, once again, Dennis Smalley, who uh, spent time uh, in Schaefer's studio in Paris. Uh, similarly, he broke uh, the modes of listening down into only three. And he felt that um, the systems that had gone before lacked a kind of a human perspective. They lacked a kind of emotional engagement with sounds, which he called reflexive listening. So he talked about uh, indicative listening, which is the listening that indicates sources or causes. Uh, reflexive listening, where we engage uh, in the values that we might have around uh, a particular sound and interactive listening, where we're moving backwards and forwards between the sound properties themselves and our responses to them, or the sound properties themselves and what they indicate about the environment around us. So Eric Clark took up the concept of uh, ecological uh, listening, introduced by William Gaver, and uh, he expanded the ecological perspective. It's not just about our envir environment, but it's also about the meanings and our cultural background and capacities. What do they enable us to understand through the sounds that we hear? Uh, Anahid Kasabian uh, is interested in listening in the postmodern age, I guess, in our current digital world, the way we engage with sounds, but specifically 
uh, the way that sound is used in commercial environments, in urban environments, and in digital environments with our uh, ubiquitous uh, and pervasive computing, network computing, mobile computing, the mobile phone streaming audio. And she introduced the idea of ubiquitous listening. Listening in the 21st century is different to the way that it has been for cultures pre preceding us because of a process called mediatization. Everything has been packaged up in uh, different kinds of media that are delivered to us continuously and uh, these kind of mediatized sounds are on a parallel with the other kinds of sounds in the environment. She calls this uh, ubiquitous listening. Now, this week's reading from an anthropological perspective uh, once again takes the uh, categories that Schaefer introduced and breaks them down to three. Uh, indexical listening is Schaefer's mode one, that's listening to sound sources, the sounds are an index or they point to things in the world. Structural listening is where sounds are bound up in some kind of rules to do with structure that could be to do with um, human speech, for example, we have uh, rules of grammar and syntax. And then finally, they wanted to come up with a way of understanding music. Uh, often when we refer to music, we uh, think that we know what we're talking about because we're talking about something that comes from our cultural perspective. But other cultures uh, treat music uh, differently. So music might be more integrated into everyday life in other cultures. And we can look at Australian Indigenous culture, traditional Australian Indigenous culture, and the way music is bound up in uh, navigation through country, singing country, uh, song lines is a term that we've heard as a way of sharing and transmitting knowledge and as a way of engaging in a particular forms of ritual. So different to our conception of the function of music, particularly when we're thinking about popular music or classical music. And uh, so Stokita and Brebeck de Mori use this term enchanted listening to encapsulate all kinds of listening that are not to do with identifying things in the environment or communicating through speech or other forms of structured uh, sonic engagement. They use the term enchanted listening to capture all these different kinds of musical and spiritual uh, practices. So let's look a little bit uh, more closely at the theories that come out of uh, this week's reading. They call them postures of listening, uh, postures that we adopt as listeners that direct our listening attention in certain ways. Uh, they want to consider listening uh, as part of the study of human culture and society of human life, the study of anthropology. And they point out, as I mentioned earlier, that physical definitions of sound as pressure waves are not useful for understanding cultural representations and social interactions associated with the objects of audition, the things that we hear, sounds. They want to move from our capacity just to hear uh, for, uh, to our capacity to attend in certain ways, to listen in certain ways. And uh, this uh, kind of attention that we might direct towards certain sounds should be distinguished from a mere awareness of sounds in the background or in the environment. And attention can be intentional, that is, focused and directed as we uh, listen when we're making our sound recordings, or it can be reactive. We hear the growl from the animal and we react to protect ourselves. What we hear depends on learned systems of knowledge and meaning. And uh, this is bound up with the processes of recognition and identification. First, we recognize uh, the sound as a animal vocalization, and then we identify it uh, based on our capacities as a listener, our cultural background. So the three uh, postures of listening, uh, indexical listening provides us with a hi an hypothesis about a cause, uh, the location of the source, the identity of the source, the behavior or the interior state of other be beings. So by listening to the way you speak to me, I might determine that perhaps you're sad. 
Indexical listening points to non-auditory causes, so we're not listening. We're not necessarily listening to sounds. We're listening to the things that produce them. The second listening posture, structural listening, abstracts from sound signals that are part of a linguistic or meaning system. It relies on an oppositional articulation of signs. This comes from the study of semiotics. Uh, we understand the meaning of a particular word uh, because it is not referring to some other thing in the world. Structural listening to points to, once again, to non-sonic structures, to uh, grammar, syntax, um, and structures from vocabulary. Finally, uh, enchanted listening treats sounds as, once again, independent from their causes, unlike indexical listening. Uh, it treats sounds as independent from their role in structures of abstract meaning. Enchanted listening is the experience of a properly auditory ontology. So an ontology is a fancy word that refers to the mode of existence of things, the kinds of things, the categories of things that uh, appear in the world. And here they're talking about the mode of existence of sounds, a properly auditory uh, mode of existence. In music we experience tension, resolution and phrasing. And these things are properties of uh, enchanted, of both enchanted listening and the uh, objects of enchanted listening, that is musical sounds. Um, we can respond to musical sound in a range of different ways, and one typical way is by dancing, and this is a, a characteristic of enchanted listening that is common across cultures. Uh, the Stephen Feld reading about the Kaluli people of the New Guinea Highlands, they have a particular kind of uh, properly auditory uh, experience of their environment, and Feld uses the term uh, waterfallness, uh, which is something that we can only experience uh, through sound, or that is unique to the cultural experience of the Kaluli people of the New Guinea Highlands. Uh, the term timbre is a rather ambiguous term, um, sound quality uh, that helps us to identify a particular sound source, and this once again is a properly auditory uh, property of experience, uh, it's a quality of sound alone. Welcome to the presentation on adding and subtracting fractions. Let's say we had a pie. If I were to ask you what one fourth plus one fourth is. Okay, so this is a joke. Uh, the rise of the buildup of attention of tension and the release of that tension uh, in the riser and drop form in electronic dance music. Uh, belong to what uh, Stokita and Brabeck call enchanted listening. And uh, in that little uh, example from the uh, little sonic meme from the internet, uh, our uh, resolution into the drop, the bass and the beat that are expected to come in, uh, are replaced by something totally unexpected. Now I want to link these concepts back to a concept that was uh, introduced in our very first lecture from David Hesmondhal. Uh, he points to the value of music in terms of its capacity to facilitate what he calls human flourishing, uh, a way of fully engaging with our lives, enriching our lives through music. And this is one of the properties that enchanted listening, this particular mode or posture of listening uh, facilitates. Not all cultures recognize music as we do, but all seem to appreciate some sonic dimension that transcends the basic needs for food, shelter and clothing. And I want to inter I want you to embrace this uh, idea that our work in audio, is to build and facilitate and create this culture that gives back to human existence its meaning and its vitality. Uh, 
uh, in audio culture or for us as music and sound designers, we engage with both the scientific and engineering principles of sound, but also, also with the principles of enchanted listening. That's our, that's our job as music and sound designers. And so I want to wish you luck in your endeavours in understanding listening and using your understanding and your capacities and the skills uh, and knowledge that you're going to acquire over the next uh, two and a half years uh, to build up your capacity to engage in the engineering of enchanted listening. There are a lot of references that you might want to have a look at that are associated with this lecture. You want to take some of these ideas further. And that concludes the lecture. <laughs> <laughs>